Good morning everyone, just a few reminders before we start. First, we are requesting everyone to register online to receive updates from us. Second, if you have any questions or comments, please type them using the comments feature of YouTube. Third, when you type your comments or questions, please state your name and your organization. We encourage everyone to subscribe to the official YouTube channel by clicking the red subscribe button that you can see on your screen. Please also like and follow us in our official Facebook. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, to our dear educators, our youth and learners of today, our policymakers who are tuned in to this very important webinar to determine the future of work and the future of our youth today. COVID-19 has disrupted all our way of life. Health services have to be, you know, uh, done in a very responsive and scaled up manner in order to save lives. Preventive measures to contain the spread of infection through lockdown and physical or social distancing, as we call it, have disrupted livelihoods, economies, and even our education. Remember when we were young, we have all the happy memories 
We have graduation ceremonies. We have very happy summer spent with our friends. But the youth of today were not able to enjoy such happiness. In an attempt to slow down or contain the spread of COVID-19, most countries in the world have closed down. And, you know, governments have to impose some distance education alternatives and even home-based learning. Almost overnight, educational processes have had to be transferred from face-to-face, -face, from schools to home-based or remote learning. And relying on connectivity, high-tech, low-tech, no-tech, these are our modalities. But it is important to note that this is temporary. All the government, scientists, educators, almost everybody, we are trying our best to adapt to this new normal brought by COVID-19 pandemic. So, yet close to half of all primary and secondary students are now moving to remote learning and in few weeks time, they will be having new normal in classes where they have to wear masks, where the temperature will be tested, where they have to observe social distancing and some choose online platforms for learning. So when you enroll today in this generation, you can make a choice whether you are uh, having your classes 100% or online, open distance learning. So these have changed the scenario, our world, and the future of the youth. There are so many lessons we learned from COVID-19 disruptions, but we are really really thinking about the future, the youth, and the world of work. So Simeo, in an effort to understand better youth today, their perceptions, their life, what, the way they live in this COVID-19 pandemic, all the challenges they face, which in our generation we have not encountered. So we would like to understand them better. And we conducted a simio survey to look at their thoughts about education and the world of work. So 99% of our 2,180 respondents are actually from Southeast Asia. Thank you so much for the respondents from Southeast Asia. And other countries participated as well, like Kuwait, India, Oman, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. So we're very thankful to those who have given us their thoughts on what is education and the future of work like. So our uh, respondents are uh, from different ages, from 50 to 20 years old, 38%, and uh, 20 to 25 years old, 31%. The others who have not indicated their age. So there are more female respondents than male respondents, and some preferred not to say what they are. So it's a good survey, rapid assessment on where they are at the moment, their thoughts and their dreams and aspirations. Let's find out what these are. So we asked them, what are the main challenges, concerns that you have experienced during the time of pandemic? Shall I say 74% of our youths are worried about their life, their fear of health, if they will survive in this pandemic. 58% of them are thinking more of their survival, our food, availability of food, and their basic needs. And while, you know, 51% are worried on connectivity, we don't have Wi-Fi, we don't have digital equipment, we cannot participate fully in our online classes. And some of the youth are, uh, you know, about a bit stressed about all of these things, so the, some 1,049 youth commented about psychosocial health, and few commented about transportation, mobility, they cannot move out of their houses, they're confined to their own homes, and they also encountered some family-related issues. So, but then we asked them further about schooling, about education. 
what are your issues? What are your challenges? So they said that they prefer face to face. Of course, nobody can substitute a very good teacher in our classroom, right? But they prefer this physical learning rather than e-learning. And they, they thought that, you know, when it's uh, home-based learning, they will be a bit care, uh, carefree. But they found out there are more assignments from our teachers during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, home-based learning. And uh, also their concern, oh, we cannot hang out with our friends. We cannot go out. We're confined to our rooms, our own uh, families. And uh, they're also concerned about community awareness. So they're, they fear about uh, community members who may be able to, you know, uh, have some effects on their their health and sanitation. Some students are also confused about their, you know, learning it's specific subject. And maybe they're worried about insufficient measures on COVID-19. And for some of those uh, who answered, they cannot attend uh, church services. And they feel that they have no longer uh, have someone to inspire them. There's no motivation and they cannot even concentrate. And so they, we asked them, what kind of support do you need during this uh, time of pandemic? So majority of them talk about healthcare supplies, safety equipment. They want the mask with them, you know, the gels, sanitation gels, and all of this safety equipment to be provided by the government or even their families. They also uh, talk about suggesting access to education, that everybody would have access to online learning platforms. And of course, they're also concerned about uh, the lockdown, not having work, not having jobs financial and economic support for them. And uh, more good vibes, positive uh, social mental health support from the community and from the family members. This is actually what they want to suggest as the support they need, the youth support. Yes. There are other uh, kinds of support they need, like language translation for some medical information. They don't understand probably some of our uh, learners who feel that they're not really well versed on English. Uh, some of the situation reports are in uh, in English, and they can be uh, somehow be very useful if they're translated. And even the radio stations in communicating this latest information. They also uh, recommend food supply while having COVID nineteen pandemic. So in some countries, they provide some support for food for families, but not all. And for those who are really unreached, they suggested gadgets, you know, loan of iPads or connectivity, Wi-Fi support, and maybe an education consultant who can help them in their uh, move from face-to-face uh, -face to online learning, as well as transportation and accessibility, which should be provided uh, at this time. So we asked them, how do you see your education, work, and career at this time and the future? As we as we transition back, so they they said that they fear uh, challenges in their education and career. So we can think like during this online and flexible learning uh, modality period, do they have the right competencies now? Can we say that they have acquired the necessary skills and competencies? So they fear about whether they are employable. They are uh, employable and they have learned something in this uh, kind of situation. So they also talk about uh, uh, digital platform. Most of them should learn about digital technology, online learning, remote work, working as well. And uh, they also think about positive attitude and improving themselves better. And uh, they, they fear about some job losses. Of course, some skills are no longer required. So they, they, they're a bit worried about this and maybe some are depressed about this. So we combine them into one. So it, they feel that there will be inefficient learning outcomes from this particular situation. And maybe few are thinking that because of COVID, with heavy use of digital technology, there will be new career paths for them. So a greatest lesson that the youth learned from the COVID-19, we ask a lot, they have a lot of answers to this, but we try to put them all together. So the le greatest lesson is about prioritizing safety, health, and sanitation. Uh, um, many of our respondents, I was surprised that they talk about having a good attitude and faith. You know, you have to have a strong faith. You need to have resilience. You need to have discipline. 
self-discipline, and because uh, most of learning are, are provided digitally and online, they need time management. They really need to uh, prioritize uh, learning through digital platforms. They also have learned about financial issues. So they, maybe in the future, we will be providing more capacity building on financial literacy issues and uh, education awareness and environmental issues as well. Cooperation with family members, these are the values that they have learned during this pandemic. They become stronger, they are together for four months already. <laughs> and they, they, this is the greatest lesson, they treasure their family members. And today, there are more good things we need to know about new normal and the future of work. Youth and what different organizations are doing in this particular topic. So we have uh, very good speakers, the Assistant Director of Education, Youth and Sports Division of ASEAN Secretariat. We have Ms. Mary Ann Therese Manuson to share everything on ASEAN's view on the youth and employability as well. We have a representative, Mr. Patra Ong Susuk Narumo. Sorry for my pronunciation. And uh, Mr. Dendi from Indonesia Center for Strategic and International Studies who have been with us many times in our strategic planning session. We are also joined by Dr. Jerome Benviahe, Dean of the College of Education, University of the Philippines, the Philippines. We are joined by Mr. David Young, very young, consultant for social and human sciences and communication and information, UNESCO Bangkok. He will be sharing a lot about what UNESCO is doing on youth and the future of work. And also we are joined by program specialist of UNESCO Asia Pacific Center for Education, Mr. Rigoberto Banta. Our, our moderator is equally young, Ms. Lynn Ann Maru from the Regional Center of Simeo, Simeo's PAFA. So I would like to turn over leadership in this discussion to Ms. Lin Ann. Ms. Lin Ann, please. Good morning, Dr. Ethel, and thank you for your welcome remarks sharing the results of the survey conducted by the Secretariat's team, from which we can draw the youth's concerns over their human security, education, and their future. And thank you for the introduction and for inviting Simeo Spafa to moderate this webinar. We're always glad to show our support for the Secretariat's activities, as always. So before we begin, I would like to welcome all of our speakers, as well as our participants, for joining us for the webinar, Southeast Asian Youth During COVID-19 Pandemic, Embracing the New Normal and the Future of Work, live streamed on YouTube via WebEx platform. A very good morning to all of our speakers and to our audience in Southeast Asia and beyond. So without further ado, I would like to start by introducing our speaker. Our webinar's keynote speaker is Ms. Mary Ann Therese Manuson. Ms. Manuson is the Assistant Director of the ASEAN Secretariat's Education, Youth, Youth and Sports Division. In this role, she is responsible for the division's operational management as well as overseeing programs and projects in support of the ASEAN sociocultural community. Following Ms. Manuzan's keynote speech, our first panelist will be Mr. Pachara Ansutsuk Narumon. He is an associate consultant specializing in policy communication and public engagement at Bolliger & Co., a Thailand-based public policy consulting firm. He graduated from Chulalongkorn University and was also selected by Thailand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to be the kingdom's youth representative in the fifth UN Econ Economic and Social Council in New York. Our second panelist will be Mr. Dandi Rapitrandi, joining us from Jakarta. Mr. Rapitrandi is a researcher at the Department of Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta, Indonesia. His areas of research focus on international economics, digital economy, and small and medium enterprises. Our third panelist, joining us from Manila, will be Dr. Jerome T. Bunyake. As Dean of the University of the Philippines College of Education, 
Dr. Jerome is a licensed professional teacher, an academic management consultant, a speaker and facilitator for seminars and workshops, and a researcher on educational leadership, policy, and development. He also teaches educational administration and research. Our following panelists will be Mr. Rigoberto Banta Jr. Rigoberto currently works as Program Specialist at the UNESCO Asia Pacific Center of Education for International Understanding, otherwise known as APSEU, based in Seoul, Republic of Korea. His work focuses on strengthening partnerships and networks in promoting international understanding and global citizenship education. Last but not least, our final speaker will be Mr. David Young, who is a consultant at UNESCO uh, Bangkok office. His work primarily focuses on providing training to young people in Southeast Asia, particularly in the area of research, media advocacy and literacy, as well as policy development. Now that all of our webinar speakers have been introduced, I would like to invite Ms. Marianne Therese Manusong from ASEAN Secretariat to deliver the keynote speech. Thanks very much, Lin An, for uh, the kind introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, before I start, I'd just like to thank um, Simu for this opportunity uh, to speak here today um, and to share with you uh, the ASEAN Secretariat's initiatives around youth development, particularly in the context of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and post-pandemic recovery efforts. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, my presentation is already, uh, okay, it's loading. Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So my presentation today will cover the following. Uh, firstly, I will touch on the new normal and the opportunities and challenges it brings to the ASEAN youth sector. And following that, I will talk a bit about ASEAN's current and emerging priorities in youth development. And finally, I'll talk about how ASEAN youth are involved in um, COVID-19 response and post-pandemic recovery efforts. Uh, to start, I'd like to share that uh, the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Pillar um, continues to prepare ASEAN citizens to be industry ready and resilient towards disruptions through digital, technical and soft skills development, vocational education, higher education cooperation, people-to-people -people exchanges, as well as leveraging sports for development and peace. Next slide, please. Sorry, could you go back to the previous slide, please? So, um, as you know, the new normal is currently changing many facets of our lives. The youth of ASEAN will have to accept this new normal and adapt to the situation. In terms of challenges, COVID-19 has caused severe disruptions in the way we live, work and communicate. However, through information and communication technologies or ICTs, uh, life has not ground to a halt and ICTs are allowing us to continue our daily routines um, through online and distance education, workout apps, online food delivery services, video conferencing platforms, etc. Next slide, please. The good news is that ASEAN youth, who comprise around a third or 34% of the combined population of ASEAN, are tech savvy. And one thing that we can be sure about is that ASEAN millennials are relatively more tech savvy uh, with um, uh, the earlier generations. Next slide, please. So there is an important opportunity here in terms of digital penetration and access. Almost 380 million people, or 58% of the ASEAN population, are using the internet. And in fact, if ASEAN were a single country, it would rank second in the world in terms of the number of monthly Facebook users. Digital technology has grown significantly in the ASEAN region, um, but unequally. And these gaps in terms of access to technology are slowing down ASEAN technology uptake. This is a significant challenge that will impact ASEAN youth's ability to adapt to the new normal. 
Next slide, please. In terms of youth development in ASEAN, I'd like to talk about the ASEAN Youth Development Index, or YDI, which is at the heart of our work. The ASEAN YDI is essentially a report aimed to provide comprehensive data on the status of young people in ASEAN across various areas or domains. The ASEAN YDI serves as the evidence base for formulating relevant policies and programs on youth development to improve both implementation and performance of youth development programs at the regional level. The five domains that are covered by the ASEAN YDI are education, health and well-being, employment and opportunity, participation and engagement, and finally, ASEAN awareness, values, and identity. Next slide, please. Health and well-being, um, among all the domains, had the highest regional average domain score in 2015, suggesting it as a strength in the region. It was followed closely by education, with employment and opportunity, and participation and engagement lagging behind. These results will inform the development of regional youth development policies and initiatives going forward. While there was an eventual improvement in volunteer time, participation and engagement remains one of the lowest averaging indicators in the YDI. Therefore, going forward, stronger efforts are needed to encourage the participation and involvement of ASEAN youth to support ASEAN community building efforts. Next slide, please. Going back to the topic of the digital divide, the ASEAN YDI report published in 2017 shows that the gap between the lowest and the highest scores of digital natives is extremely wide. The lowest score is at 1%, while the highest is at 88%. Next slide, please. The current ASEAN Youth Development Priorities 2016-2020 can support ASEAN youth to face the challenges of the new normal, particularly by increasing youth competencies and resilience with advanced technological and managerial skills, strengthening youth involvement and participation in building an ASEAN community through volunteerism opportunities and leadership programs, and finally, by promoting youth entrepreneurship through capacity building and mentoring programs. Next slide, please. One example of um, an ASEAN youth-led initiative um, is uh, the production of youth-friendly materials that were developed by the Southeast Asia Youth Network and the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, or IFRC. So these materials were uh, developed to promote sanitation and hygiene, as well as positive social interactions among the youth in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Through collaboration with the IFRC, these materials have been widely disseminated to ASEAN member states and youth organizations to be used as a reference in developing COVID-19 materials targeting the youth. Next slide, please. I believe that the fifth domain of ASEAN YDI on ASEAN awareness, values, and identity can inspire ASEAN youth to contribute to community development in the region. It is our hope that a strong sense of ASEAN awareness, values, and identity among the youth will enhance their role in contributing towards sustainable development and regional integration. The study on this remaining domain is ongoing. In addition, I'd like to share that 2020 has been designated as the year of ASEAN identity. Next slide, please. The strategic direction of the ASEAN youth sector and its priorities is very much relevant to the new normal. Among the emerging priorities of the ASEAN youth sector are fostering 21st century skills to face the challenges of the new normal and in the context of the fourth industrial revolution or 4IR. This will involve developing future ready youth through skills development, particularly digital skills to be able to adapt to 4IR. This will also involve encouraging youth engagement with both policymakers and the community through the institutionalization of youth engagement mechanisms, particularly through volunteering opportunities and leadership programs. Hopefully, this will be able to encourage youth to be more engaged with the community and support them in coping with the psychosocial impacts of COVID-19. Next slide, please. 
I'd also like to share that uh, ASEAN education priorities in its current work plan 2016-2020 include future-ready education and skills development, enhancing higher education through internationalization, strengthening technical and vocational education and training, integrating 21st century needs in education. Um, the ASEAN Declaration on Human Resource Development for the Changing World of Work will actually be adopted um, uh, tomorrow at the ASEAN Summit. And this declaration reaffirms uh, the region's commitment to equip its human resources with the competencies that will prepare them to be future ready, thereby enabling them to actively contribute to the sustainable development, competitiveness, and resilience of the ASEAN region. Another priority in the education work plan is ensuring inclusive education. Um, and this includes uh, policy reforms to remove barriers, utilizing technology for learners with special needs, and continuing the implementation of the ASEAN Safe Schools Initiative. Finally, capacity building for education personnel is also identified as a key priority. And this will include initiatives to promote new technologies, 21st century skills, and new pedagogies. Next slide, please. With the help of uh, ICT, skills in community engagement and social networks, ASEAN youth can contribute to youth development at any level. Social innovations such as opportunities for online volunteering, regional and global online capacity building platforms, as well as online global movements provide opportunities for the youth to take part in shaping their future. Networks of youth organizations can lead discussions on the future of work post COVID-19, and explore new approaches to address the emerging challenges. Academia, decision makers, and the private sector should welcome collaboration with ASEAN youth and harness their dynamism and creativity in this regard. We are hopeful that the new normal will generate more best practices, more knowledge and experiences that will inspire ASEAN youth and help them to develop new skills relevant to the future of work. Next slide, please. The youth have a critical role to play in limiting the outbreak and mitigating its impact on public health, society, and the economy. On the positive side, amidst the disruptions, ASEAN youth leadership is at the forefront of efforts to fight COVID-19. ASEAN youth have been responding to the pandemic in a multitude of ways, including by serving as healthcare workers and community volunteers, leading public health promotion initiatives, as well as fighting the pandemic through artistic, scientific, entrepreneurial, and technological innovations. An end to the COVID-19 pandemic remains uncertain. Going forward, young people will be indispensable and at the heart of an inclusive post-pandemic recovery and ASEAN community building efforts. I'm pleased to share with you that the ASEAN Secretariat will be organizing a webinar series on ASEAN youth at the forefront of the COVID-19 response. With a view to raise the profile of ASEAN youth driving the fight against COVID-19 and to exchange experiences, offer insights on mobilizing youth support, and ultimately generate recommendations to expand youth participation in responding to the COVID-19 outbreak and post-pandemic recovery efforts. The webinar will feature a panel discussion with inspiring and dedicated frontliners, youth leaders, volunteers, entrepreneurs, innovators, and change makers from ASEAN member states on how youth leadership can be leveraged in addressing challenges at the community, national, regional, and global levels. So the, the, this concept is still um, under development and it's being consulted with the ASEAN senior officials meeting on youth. So um, please stay tuned um, to our social media channels for um, updates on um, this uh, forthcoming event. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. ...opportunities and challenges for youths in Southeast Asia and for sharing ASEAN's strategic plan in addressing these. Um, and especially in how ASEAN is uh, offering ways for youth to empower themselves through ASEAN initiatives. Uh, next, we would like to invite our youth representative for this event, Mr. Pachara Angsuksuk Narumon.
to deliver his presentation uh, to share his perspectives on the experience of the youth during this time and how their future in the workplace may be affected by the recent pandemic. Mr. Pachara, please go ahead. Right. Um, thank you very much, um, Colin, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Simo, for having me speaking on such a very knowledgeable um, panel, panel discussion today. So I was tasked to talk about um, youth and employability. So I named my presentation um, a nickname, the so-called the struggle of the lockdown generation. But before I start um, my answer to, to um, the youth and the employability, I would like to us to be on the same page and understand what's actually happening today. Um, report by the United Nations addressing that 94% of the world's workers are facing some type of workplace closure measure, whether it's a re reduction in working hours or change in physical location, work from home, that's affecting 94%. And if we take um, those loss in hours, loss of jobs into um, account and combine them together, that's equivalent to 305 million full-time jobs. And those um, high number of jobs loss are actually very intense in the high, highly labor-intensive industry, including food and accommodations, you know, as people cannot go on, on vacation anymore, those are the first group to take the hit. Uh, retails and wholesales, we cannot go to the malls as, you know, social distancing is put in place. Those affect more than uh, 400 million workers worldwide. And business services and administration, when people work from home, business services and, you know, admin staff are facing um, working challenges and manufacturing, of course, as it is very hard to keep physical distancing in a manufacture um, and production line. What is actually very sad is that um, out of those number, more than four out of 10 people, 40% are the young people that are in the bottom of the pyramid. And once the shockwave hit the pyramid, those in the bottom go first. So that's the problem addressing younger generation um, specifically. So I named them, the United Nations named them actually the lockdown generation. So I simplify my presentation to address only one question. Um, how could the lockdown generation be ready to bounce back in the post-COVID world? And my answer to you is simply three things. I named them the 3D strategy. So let's start with the first D, it's demand. It is very important to, um, once you lost your job or you're looking to change or you know have a movement in your career life, it is very important to look at the demand. What are the, what are the industry actually talking about and what are the um, hire are looking for. Um, so I take a look at LinkedIn, what is actually being in trends on, on the hashtag of LinkedIn. In January, February and March of this year, you can see that um, quite a lot of job specific um, words were actually mentioning on LinkedIn a lot. Um, first, we see marketing, we see real estate, we see innovation and we see digital marketing. As people are on early on in January lockdown, people are shopping online, working online, so digital marketing um, probably experiencing an extensive growth. I take a look further on what kind of jobs are actually being posted on LinkedIn the most in during this time. On the left hand side, it's the most job available as of June 15, I think, the number of the jobs that are offered on LinkedIn the most. So we see, you know, healthcare workers, um, supermarket department specialists, software engineer. Well, on the right hand side, you can see the biggest increase from April to May. These figures does not represent the whole job industry. That's, as you may know, a lot of jobs are not on LinkedIn, but this is the easiest way that we can, how to say, sort of generalize the demand that on the market. One observation though that I have drawn from this um, data, set of data, uh, you can see a lot of the small shops icon that I've put. I noticed that there's a lot of jobs opening that are related to the supply chain management and retails, as I believe food security and you know online shopping and supply chain are very, very relevant to the part of our um, security for food and for living supply as well. So I, that is my observation. I think it's very becoming more relevant in those kind of jobs. That leads us to the second D, um, which is actually design. Um, what to design, so you're probably wondering. Um, there's one very famous saying, um, said that to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? But what if a COVID-19 is a disruption that 
wipe away all the nails, um, what would a, would a hammer um, be good to do? Right. So I think the post COVID world for younger generation, it wouldn't be a man with only a hammer. Would it be better if that man had a hammer, a screwdriver and a wrench at the same time? You know, so the question that I put design as my second D is to design your toolbox. I ask, I encourage younger generation, those teachers to ask your student what is in your tools box. In the previous day, um, type of person that will work in a specific industry would tend to be in a professional level, tend to care about more a core competencies, unique skill and deep expertise. So it would go more on a vertical line and, you know, let's go deeper to be a specialist on something. So the movement of the career will be from role to role, right? But post COVID world, I think with a disruption in pace, we cannot really, you know, forecast what is coming in the long term. So everything will be a middle term and short term and people would tend to move around a lot. So um, I think um, people would become more towards professional generalist where core values of them are versatility, broad minded and agility. And once they have those, um, you know, wider in um, the the wide, the width, um, not so much on the depth anymore, but they also have, uh, it's still required to have, you know, a core area on specialization as well, but you have to be broad in um, your perspective on the surface as well. And once that have put in place, I think people would tend to move from industry to industry more. Right. And how to broaden your tools box. There's a lot of, you know, online courses right now, as you can see, there's some statistics available. Um, more than 100 million students are actually um, taking MOOC classes online offered by more than 900 universities around the world, many courses um, and, you know, almost a thousand micro credentials you can earn. You probably have to pay extra for, or, you know, from some platform with 50 MOOC based degree. You know, and if you take a look at the course um, distribution by subject, it's pretty much like universities. You know, you see um, various disciplinaries starting from business, science, humanities, education, mathematics, art. Uh, probably most of them are on technology and business space. And if you take a look of how well those um, website performing, you know, providing MOOC courses are actually doing in this. COVID lockdown period, you can see that a lot of that side are actually strive double digit increase in the ranking of, you know, um, the world website ranking Two in specific though, that performed really, really well, because Sarah and edX has made it through, um, you know, the 1000 website rank threshold, um, becoming in the top 1000 website rank. It is very hard to have, you know, learning a website on the 1000 because it's very boring. I registered to many of them, but I, um, unfortunately, I didn't really finish one, but I just looked through it as an inspiration. Session in, in clicks also increased tremendously. It's double digits and third digits as well in, in many in websites. So that leads us to the final D is to digitize. Uh, first, let look how relevant, how to stay relevant. That's my question, and I think it is very, very important um, to become, you know, digitized. But we have to also to bear in mind the current situation that ASEAN is in. Um, right, as you can see, um, there's a lot of differences going on. Only on one indicators of of digital digitalization is, you know, if you take a look at the internet penetration in Southeast Asia. You can see those in, you know, 80 plus Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Brunei, where 80, more than 80% of its population can access to the internet. And on the other end of, of you know, Southeast Asia, we have Tamil Leste, Myanmar, Laos, um, where the people can only access internet um, by 30 plus percent. However, integrating as a region would probably be a challenge. Um, ASEAN though, have um, a lot of good, place a uh, good plan in place. We have specifically digital uh, ASEAN digital skill vision um, by 2020. I think it's a collaboration with the World Economic Forum. Not sure whether it's a, a secretariat initiative um, or not, but it's a very good plan, you know, to have um, these plan in place. Um, plan to train 20 million worker, plan to train, you know, uh, raise 2 million US dollars, 200,000 ASEAN digital workers. Um, internship opportunities, 
200 ASEAN regulators and 40 million ASEAN individual citizens. That's very important. I think another um, digitized incidents that are happening right now is the 36 ASEAN summit that are, ha that are happening you know, virtually um, online. So we have to ask a lot of questions about these new normal. What would be your classroom rules online? What would be the diplomatic protocols on, you know, diplomatic virtual meetings? These kind of questions, I think ASEAN has to also be addressed as well. Another interesting issue when it comes to the final D into digitai is the digital literacy. I think a lot of introduction, a lot of surveys are actually focusing on students, how well they're doing, what do they need, um, what they're looking for. I, but I think digital literacy, it goes both way. I mean, it's as important as um, to students to be able to access and know how to use the media as, as it is important to those teachers to be able to, you know, teaching online. Are you ready to producing, you know, online class materials? Um, and put them online. How would you keep your student engaged throughout your, you know, sessions? You know, t I am a tutor myself as well, and it's very hard to be, you know, sitting alone and looking at your computer. And you know, you know that behind the computer there's a lot of student watching. But how can you keep them engaged? So a different, a whole new paradigm of techniques has to be involved in that teaching method. So apart from digital literacy, that ASEAN citizens uh, both the older ones and the younger one, that's go to everyone, right? Um, are as equal importance to another, I would say digital culture. So I, in my company, there's a three core digital culture that we uh, do, we call it three high. First is high trust. So when, when you do digitize your lesson online, your work um, environment online. The first thing that has to be the basic of that is the trust. You have to trust your own student that they would show up, that they would not cheat on your exam, even though it's, you know, a closed book online exam and you cannot really check whether they are opening the book or not. It has to begin with the trust and that would, would how it would work. The second one is high, high touch. When you're digitizing something, it doesn't mean that you have to lose the connection of them. So you have you once you digitize those formal interaction between you and your students or you and your coworkers, the informal part of it has to also be digitized as well. So I think that's a part to bear in mind as well. And the last one is high tech. Be mindful and and be ready to to integrate and utilize all the technologies, um, many applications that allow you to connect. Um, virtually, both formally and informally. And I think that's pretty much the 3D strategy that I would suggest um, educators, policymakers, and youth um, to be ready to bounce back. So if you don't really get what I'm trying to say, uh, what I'm trying to say is to ask you three questions. Where is the opportunity now? That's the demand. What, what's in your toolbox? That's the design. And how to stay, stay relevant? That's to digitize. And that sums up my 3D strategy for youth and employability today. I'd like to end my presentation with one quote. Uh, there's no deadline for success, as I believe youth nowadays are very intense to become successful um, very young. With this difficult time, people lost their jobs. Don't, you don't have to put too much pressure on yourself. There is no deadline for success. We probably be taught to be, you know, fail fast, learn fast, uh, fail fast, success fast. That's too much pressure for this difficult time. Just remember, there's no deadline for success. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn or, or via email um, if you have any further questions or um, any um, issues that want that I might be able to help. And yeah, I think that's it for for my part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kun Pachara, for uh, providing a comprehensive um, summary of the employment landscape and for sharing the challenges and anxieties that you in Southeast Asia are facing and probably across the globe are facing today and how we could possibly meet these challenges in the region, especially in promoting effective digitization. So for our next presentation, I would like to invite our next panelist, Mr. Dandi Rafitrandi, joining us from Indonesia to discuss his perspectives on uh, Southeast Asian youth during COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much, Ms. Lina, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to share my uh, PowerPoint right now. Oops. 
Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, say thank you for the Secretariat for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel. Uh, uh, for today, I will talk about uh, a bit more sort of like a macro perspective of uh, the youth and also uh, how, how youth is impacted by the COVID-19. So, uh, because uh, I'm actually from the uh, think tank, which is a research uh, uh research institute uh we are a center for strategic and international studies uh we are independent uh non-profit think tank which also uh focusing on economics international relations and politics social change we also have a special unit and disaster management which is related to uh our uh, COVID development right now so we have two uh sort of like COVID events related which is the first one is the CSIS commentaries uh, we do have a special coverage on COVID-19. We also collaborate with government institutions, private sectors, and NGOs. Uh, and also we have quite a lot of webinars um, uh, and upcoming up web webinars as well on COVID-19 development. We invite several international and national speakers to sort of like exchange of knowledge between experts and also general public. So if you want to know more about CSIS, uh, you can go into our website at csis.or.id. That's a, a, a brief background about uh, uh, CSIS. So my, my presentation will be divided into several parts. The first one, we will go to a uh, recent development of the COVID-19 itself and how it actually uh, developed in our region. And also I will go into the COVID-19 effect on youth. Um, I will also dig deeper on the, uh, uh, related issues about uh, youth and employment. And I will uh, illustrate one of the case study of uh, Indonesia's program related to pandemic uh, COVID-19 response. And then I will brief up, uh, brief a summary uh, about our presentation today. So uh, the International Monetary Fund actually referred this pandemic crisis as a crisis like no other. It means that there are health crisis, economic crisis combined into a massive um, recession, which can be compared with um, Great Depression in the 1930s. So it's one of the features actually it, uh, the, the pandemic and the crisis has to uh, many unknown unknown factors, which is high uncertainty. Uh, for example, we don't really know uh, what will happen after we uh, find a, the vaccine, right? Whether um, uh, we when, when we will get the vaccine. And if we can, uh, for example, lower the reproduction rate of the COVID-19 itself, will it be efficient? Uh, and then uh, what is the, the, more, the most efficient policies of lockdown? Uh, should we go for lockdown, total lockdown or a, a partial lockdown? It's also um, uh, uncertainty. So it's actually a great uh, uh, test for all of the blue world because it's actually exposing the global and the max, uh, domestic economic vulnerability. For example, you have to choose between which one to save first, which one to have the priority. Uh, whether it's economy, you want to open your uh, economy first, or you have to face by the, the great fatality because of the, the COVID. Uh, it's also exposing institutional quality variation throughout the, the whole worldwide. Uh, there are countries that are actually excel in the implementation of the lockdown, but there are some countries that are st still struggling. So it also uh, uh, exposed the public health uh, system vulnerability in our world right now. Uh, also, I have to mention that we are in the sort of like a leaderless world because uh, 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 there is a deadlock in our multilateralism um, uh, mechanism in this world. For example, WHO deadlock, and then also uh, there are quite a growing distrust among countries right now. So it's hard to uh, to maintain this pandemic without a captain, for example. Uh, and also a uh, business perspective, which I refer to uh, the most agile uh, uh, actors in economy, they have to face with a double disruption, both in supply and also the demand side. So uh, they also have to adapt for, uh, for example, with the new normal, such as work from home and online meeting. Uh, this is actually a cartoon that I feel pretty um, hilarious, right? The why, who led the digital transformation and then the answer probably the COVID-19. 
So this is just a uh, illustration of how the the ASEAN, our region, you can see that uh, there are three countries which are Indonesia, Singapore, and uh, Philippines that ha still have a, a, a quite a steep curve in terms of the number of uh, COVID-19 cases uh, compared to other countries. So we can, we can expect that the number uh, is still growing. So I will go into the, the effect on the youth uh, itself. So I will divide it, the, the effect into two, uh, which is the first one is the short term effect and the second one is a long term effect. So the short term first is about the lockdown policy, as already mentioned by our previous speakers. Uh, uh, the youth will feel like the pandemic lowering their mobility. Uh, they like to travel, they like to do sports, right? But the lockdown policy actually uh, uh, make them cannot uh, can I go outside and act, uh, do all of those uh, act activities. So it's not only attack the physical health, but also give them a physiological well-being and mental health risk. So uh, that's that's also one of the points that I would like to make because it's it's very important. And the second one, uh, which is also uh, uh, quite important too, which is the education and learning. Uh, we don't have really a, uh, an evidence whether there is the same result between in-class and on online class experience. I think from the previous speakers, we also have to be honest that uh, I think teachers and educators also still learning about this online class experience, right? So I think both of students and, and teachers are disrupted in a way uh, that have to adapt with this uh, 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 the new normal. So uh, I, I, I also would like to um, highlight whether the difference in ICT access will have a different education outcome. Uh, maybe it's not relevant for some countries, but in Indonesia, we do have a digital divide, which is the ICT infrastructure is not the same across the region. And then uh, we might have a different education outcome, which is a very, uh, very bad for uh, our future generations. And also one of the, uh, the thing that I would like to emphasize also, we have to also uh, consider the international student condition right now because uh, they, they might uh, be uh, uh, at, at the, uh, the, the impacted uh, a group that is uh, not really seen by the countries where, do, where, where they're uh, in the institution, uh, education institution right now. So, uh, we have to wear that the international student also need uh, some kind of uh, uh, and, and also uh, attention uh, regarding this pandemic. And the third one is the compliance, whether, you know, the, the youth has a lower risk, uh, but high potential as a breeder. So the question is, will they comply to the new normal or not? Right. So and then the, the last one is uh, we have uh, youth has a very high, uh, higher digital platform use, which is exposed to a higher digital uh, cybersecurity and also digital risk. The long term effect is more um, uncertain because you can see from my slide, there are a lot of uh, question marks here. So what the digital divide, the first one is whether digital divide can actually contribute to the inequality in wider income, also in learning inequality. And the second one is whether uh, the long term impact of the health and economic crisis can actually lead to social and political unrest uh, as as a uh, as a as a as a, uh, as a public distrust uh, illustration. And then uh, whether the change in people's behavior, as you can see, whether this is a non hysteric or hysteric, it means whether the change that we already discussed uh is a permanent or a non-permanent one this is very important and then whether this uh this pandemic can contribute to a deadlock in some most pressing issues for future generations such as sustainability labor rights skills uh, i think those are uh, uh uh issues that is really relevant for the youth right now uh for the youth and employment so we we uh in the uh, we have to begin with uh, young people who are not in employment, education, or training, which is NEET, is still relatively high even before even uh, even before the pandemic. So uh, uh, that's that's one thing that uh, that have to uh, be in the mind of the government. Pandemic might contribute to higher uh, NEET uh, in the future. Youth is vulnerable to layoff because most of them also in the inf 
more uh, youth are actually in the informal sector and also they are a cheaper option to get laid off uh, compared to other uh, uh, groups. And the third one, uh, you uh, maybe it is very uh, vulnerable to, to automation trend. As you know, many young people probably in the, in the uh, entry level of job right now, which is prone to automation. And then if the company see this, uh, there, there will be a higher risk of right now, it might lead to a faster robotization. So uh, as you can see that the, the, the uh, young, young generation right now is actually more educated, well, well, well educated, but they have a high job insecurity right now because uh, they're not really uh, sure about uh, what, what kind of job that, avail that will be available for them uh, in the future. And then the job market outlook is not really good right now. If you want to go to startup services sector, those are very impacted right now. Entrepreneurship or skilling program, which skill that I really need to go uh, with. And then finally, should I go back to school? I mean, look at now, school is still online and et cetera. Whether they, so they, they kind of uh, 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 confuse whether uh, what kind of step that, that, uh, that, that they will try to make after this. And then it's some in the more long term effect, uh, uh, we have the scaring effect, whether this pandemic will have a, a long term and medium uh, effect on the which an employment penalty compared to other generations. So this is what we what what I'm what I'm scaring. And then uh, one of the case study for the uh, for Indonesian. So we have the pre-employment card program in Indonesia. It started as a program that aimed to increase recent graduate skills, which is tar targeting young people. And one of the instruments to improve the skill for the future uh, is actually like the uh, internationals uh, mimic the international uh, skills future in Singapore. But however, due to the pandemic, the targeted group shifted to the impacted workers uh, because of the pandemic. So. There are a lot of mismatch skill trainings. Uh, it's only the, the deliver uh, online, and also they have a totally different objective, right? So this, uh, in this case of study, I would like to highlight. Uh, I think uh, the government doesn't look youth and young generation as a their priority right now uh, because of the pandemic. So in summary, uh, 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 I will uh, I will give a summary for for my presentation. The first one, yes, youth will be more vulnerable to the shock. Uh, we have to uh, identify what are the short term and long term impact, whether it's temporary or permanent uh, equilibrium after this after the pandemic. So, how to increase the adaptability? Uh, you can invest in learning new skill set, agile, and adapting new technology, but Please, the priority is still always your health and your mental health. So uh, the second one, you can engage in social activism and volunteerism, uh, which is, I think, empathy and creativity is uh, really uh, uh, expensive right now. It's a very uh, a thing that, that, that you look for uh, right now. So in the fourth one is uh, we have a quite limited data on youth for example, on employment and job related statistics. So you might want to uh, look at your government statistics, whether they have a statistic regarding youth, because if we don't really know what kind of uh, youth and how they behave, it will put uh, youth uh, uh, under the radar. Uh, and also you, we haven't talked about the gender perspective on youth, which is totally different discussion. Right. And then the last one, the government should focus uh, to increase public trust right now uh, by having a robust policy response and also transparency. Uh, I think that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much. Terima kasih. Uh, you can uh, also uh, contact me via uh, my email and I would like to have your uh, questions after this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dandy, for highlighting how the pandemic has brought to light certain vulnerabilities and uncertainties among Southeast Asia's youth, and how this is changing the socio-political landscape of the region, which is surely felt across the globe. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to invite our following speaker, Dr. Jerome Winbiache, joining us from the University of the Philippines. Dr. Jerome.
Thank you, Lynn, and uh, thank you, Simeo, for having me uh, this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga. Um, today, um, I'm going to share with you possible ways to reshape education, and uh, or should I say, these are actual scenarios that probably we can be expecting when schools open back um, others in July and in August or probably in September. So these small virus is uh, these very small virus has actually gave a big and huge impact on the world economy, as mentioned by a lot of speakers and by um, Dr. Ethel a while ago. It affected the world economy, the tourism, the lifestyle, okay, the way we are living our life right now. But most especially, it has affected education sector. Um, specifically in education. Okay, it has affected the learning delivery, our resources, and definitely the education environment. However, it only takes one letter to change our perspective. Uh, this particular change also gives us a chance. And this chance or opportunity is to fight for the rights to education because we have to bear in mind that education should remain protected for all the youth, and this is something that is non-negotiable. Education is very important because, according to some researches, education has a stabilizing effect on learners, especially during the time of emergencies. It brings a sense of normalcy that softens the blow of vulnerability in times of disorder. Therefore, to move forward in these challenging times, the education sector needs to demonstrate resilience. And resilience here is the ability to overcome adversity. Education as a sector is the unifying um, discipline or the field, unifying field to connect all the anxiety of the society. And as mentioned by, by the researchers I mentioned, it brings this state, um, stabilizing effect no, among our youth. So in response to, okay, um, in, in times of this chaos, education should find opportunities and we should learn to thrive despite these difficult circumstances. So in response to this, the University of the Philippines College of Education has produced a white paper. We entitled it, Stay Well, Keep Learning, this is about education resilience and learning continuity in the time of COVID-19. We formulated this one. Um, this is a group of uh, a pool of education experts in our college, in our institution. As the dean, uh, it is also headed by Dr. Monterola and a lot of uh, uh, professors who are experts in different areas in education. Our suggestion as we observe reshaping the new normal in education is that we have to consider the principles of inclusion, compassion, and innovation. Out of these principles, we developed strategies that can be used in reshaping education in this time of pandemic. And these are the eight strategies. I will be discussing briefly one by one all these strategies. These strategies are correspondent on different education components, as you can see here on the left. Okay. And um, these strategies are suggested actions for which we can really apply the principles of inclusion, innovation, and compassion. It is very important to ask the following question. Are, are the ways we are doing in school during this time of pandemic responsive to the diverse learners? Is it equitable, inclusive, and accessible? Does it provide better solution? And most importantly, it should not compromise quality education. So we have formulated this framework. It's like viewing from the top with the interconnected strategies revolving around the principles of inclusion, innovation, and compassion. The sense here is education should protect every school because inside every school uh, is, of course, every youth no, um, that will develop our society. Therefore, we should be 
educators who are resilient. We, we should have education system that is resilient and that is promoting learning continuity. So the primary question I'd like everyone to reflect on this morning is how will these strategies help in reshaping education for the new normal? Key strategy one is about prioritizing teacher and student safety, health, and well-being. There are five sub strategies here, but for us to briefly understand this, the first three points is about practices in schools that prioritize safety and health well-being of the stakeholders. And then the second part is focusing on the individual support. And I'm glad that I'm hearing from other speakers that it is very important to practice self-care and to provide psychosocial support. And this is not only for our learners, the youth, but this is also for the teachers, the administration, and all the members of the school community, including the parents, of course. The second key strategy is focusing on recalibrating curricular and assessment priorities. This is about looking and reviewing at the learning essentials. What are the important things that should be learned in school now? It's also important to consider that we should involve everyone, especially the learners themselves in the learning process. So a point such as assessing to inform students about their learning is very important in this time of pandemic. Youth be included on the things that they want to learn and how this learning can be used relevantly in their lives. Key strategy three is about enacting flexible, flexible learning options. And here we, we, we have been talking about innovations. But the notion is that technology is all about high technologies. But we have to remember that technologies, as also mentioned by Dr. Ethel a while ago, it is about high technology, low technology, and even no technology. Therefore, in reshaping the education, it is very important to be inclusive. We have to remember that learning must not build on anxiety. We have to capitalize on what we have so that we can um, have uh, optimum results, uh, especially at this time of pandemic. Key strategy four is about empowering families for home-based learning. Here we are acknowledging the important role of family, especially for the youth, in that when we learn at home, it is very important that learning is part of our daily activities. As I mentioned, it's about self-care and not adding anxiety among our learners. And therefore, this should be uh, fun learning and routines that are already integrated at home. Key strategy number five is about leading for resilience and innovation. And it's good to hear from other speakers that many sectors are thinking not only for a specific um, field, but of course you can see that it resonates always in the education sector. And when we, we talk about uh, leading for resilience, we are not only talking about the school administrators, but this also involves the teachers and the students th themselves. Therefore, we can say that when we lead for resilience and innovation, we are talking about the dynamics of the people within the schools, within the education system, that would really lead to resilience and innovation. So it's very important to involve the youth in this decision making and in involve everybody. Key strategy number six is on redesigning the learning environment. And here we are talking about the physical environment that should be safe and most especially psychological environment that considers the well-being of all the students, the teachers, and everybody in the school. Key strategy number seven is about evaluating education financing. Here it is very important. We suggest that we think, we think about our resource allocation. What are our priority needs? And most especially, it is very important to recalibrate the uh, school operations and think of um, sufficient funds that we can use for this time of emergency. And finally, it's very important to create new knowledge. Research is very important in this time of pandemic. We have to understand how educational technologies reshape our education. And it is very important to look at the social context of this, it's like looking at how effective, rather comparing the face-to-face -face learning and the remote learning. And when we say remote learning, we're not only 
talking about learning online, but it's also uh, talking about learning that does not use high technologies. So this is how we pr uh, propose education should be reshaped in this time of pandemic. And it is very important that in every action that we do, we have to think strategically and we have to apply the principles of inclusion, innovation, and compassion. As an uh, ending to this presentation, again, I, 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 I shared this uh, in the beginning that um, this virus is really small. It cannot even be seen by the naked eye, but it created a huge impact in education and other sectors. But what is the most important thing here? Let us learn a life lesson. According to Oprah Winfrey, this may be hard times for all of us, but let us all turn our wounds into wisdom. You may visit our website, the University of the Philippines College of Education, if you want to, to get an access of the full paper. We are also inviting everyone for our webinar series that expounds uh, these strategies. Um, it is aired every Tuesdays and Fridays in Facebook and YouTube also, uh, uh, 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Fridays, and this will run until um, the second week of August. Um, these are my references. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Jerome, for outlining ways to make education more resilient in times of crises, as well as for your suggestions on how to better ensure the sustainability of education in Southeast Asia through things like education, um, new knowledge, and redesigning the learning environment. Um, I would now like to invite Mr. Rigoberto uh, Banta joining us from APCU in Seoul, Korea for the next presentation. Rigoberto? Yes, hello. Um, yes, uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for, uh, thank you Lynn for my, the introduction and uh, thank you uh, Semeo for um, inviting me in this uh, very important um, uh, occasion. Um, I am honored uh, to be with this uh, very important panel uh, uh, list of panelists um, who have really discussed and dealt uh, with uh, with important issues um, in terms of youth and uh, and COVID nineteen. I think um, most uh, our pan uh, the presenters who um, were in front of me um, discussed uh, very intensively, uh, comprehensively about uh, as well uh, about the about the micro level um, um, details of of you of the implications of. COVID-19 to the youth and their, their employability, but at the same time, I think it's important uh, to take a step back and then uh, take a look into um, how this affects uh, affects the whole society at large and the role of youth as well in that uh, perspective. Um, so maybe before I start, um, I would like to uh, mention briefly about my organization. So um, I am uh, I'm a program specialist at the UNESCO Asia Pacific Center of Education for International Standing. Um, and I currently work on networking and partnerships here in our center, primarily focused on promoting education for international standing and global citizenship education. Um, so on a daily basis, uh, we support education systems around uh, in the Asia Pacific and beyond so that they can transform education systems uh, by providing capacity building opportunities, um, developing research uh, and uh, research tools and um, uh, pedagogical tools, um, developing materials as well as uh, networking and partnerships. So um, just moving and just moving on uh, to uh, our present uh, my presentation um, today. My task is to again uh, take a step back and look at the society at large and look into the role of youth. And uh, finally, I would like to provide some uh, policy suggestions, very brief policy suggestions. Um, so I would like to uh, take uh, in a look into uh, the important lessons of COVID-19. So um, yes, uh, let me look into my presentation. Uh, the stark and the new realization that the common challenges such as pandemic, climate change, and widening inequality can only be tackled through common global solidarity and cooperation based on a sense of belonging to a common humanity. And no one or no nation can be safe alone uh, in this interconnected world. The weaker global solidarity and cooperation remain, the bigger becomes the global crisis. According to a survey um, 
Apart, according to a uh, survey by the UN, apart from the pro, apart from providing universal health care, um, many people around the world um, focus on the importance of strengthening solidarity amongst different nations. So this is the second uh, highest priority amongst respondents in this survey. And um, along with strong public health care systems, citizens' attitudes and actions have proved to be key to lowering the knowledge of uh, the pandemic crisis and overcoming it with the least sacrifices. Such attitude and capabilities for action are best built and sustained through global citizenship education in schools and lifelong learning institutions. To tackle the current pandemic crisis and prepare for next ones, we need to reinforce this kind of education that enables people of all ages to take responsible action. Accurate and scientific information is crucial for citizens' responsible action. Fake news, hate, uh, hate expression, and disinformation are extremely harmful, harmful in these times of crisis. It is essential that peoples of all ages develop media and information literacy to critically analyze and share information responsibly. Today's decisions will determine which directions the post-pandemic world may go. Wherever we will see more global solidarity and cooperation or more national egoism and isolationism depends to a great extent upon decisions that governments and citizens together make together. Um, yeah, make today. Um, I'm happy to see that uh, the South, uh, the true Simeo, the Southeast Asian nations, are really um, gathering together to tackle the the, the challenges uh, that we face uh, in solidarity. It is vital that citizens of the world be empowered to make informed and responsible decisions. And global citizenship education has an important role to play in this regard. Yes. So um, on this backdrop, I think it's important uh, to look into the implications. This, uh, in this backdrop, the implications the young people around the world will put pressure on them as well as to their societies, particularly in Southeast Asia, where the where the population is composed heavily of young people. Not only will their education be affected, but also their employment prospects. It is key to realize that while the challenge is looming in the background. There may be spaces for opportunities as well, which should be maximized. Um, of the social economic impact, Southeast Asian uh, countries are, hard, um, are very much affected by the decline of key industries, including tourism and service sectors that employs many young people. The ILO has reported that it, is, uh, it will be impossible to see an early bounce back to these sectors, and some economists even speculate the possible recession for countries that heavily rely on these sectors. Southeast Asian countries must work uh, with young people in order to develop new creative ways to revive these industries or decisively transform them. In some countries um, with limits uh, to international uh, travel, domestic travel is being promoted. Hotels and resorts are being transformed and used in other ways such as organic farms and uh, so on. The pharmaceutical and medical sectors and digital financing sectors are experiencing a boom right now. And I, I think that the youth um, should look into this, uh, the, the sectors as well as there is high demand. The crisis has forced uh, Southeast Asia to technologize and the youth are set to, uh, to lead this trend, being born and raised in the dig digital era. With tools at the tip of their hands available, young people can maximize, um, and maximize their opportunities for employment as well not limited to those within their own countries. At the same time, the crisis allows the digital generation to learn valuable life skills at home and in their communities. However, we must not forget that the region is experiencing great inequalities. All young people must be included in the policies that the government will be implementing. Otherwise, risk to exacerbate the challenges further. While battling the virus, Southeast Asian countries should closely consider the following policy suggestions. First, um, as was mentioned by many of our speakers, um, education continuity must be ensured at all levels. But at the same time, I would like to mention that it's important uh, that by all means to develop essential skills for the new normal. Um, the, Philippi uh, the Philippines, for example, is in embarking on an initiative to provide education beyond online classes um, through radio, television, and if not possible, traditional print materials. Online classes and technical educational education are provided by the Philippines as well to hone skills that may be used for entrepreneurial ventures. Simeo can serve as the clearinghouse for these initiatives in Southeast Asia 
to enhance knowledge and policy exchange. It is important uh, to exchange knowledge with other countries beyond Southeast Asia as well, in order to get inspiration, at the same time to explore synergies with, this, with the uh, existing initiatives of these different countries. And second is that uh, the government should develop spaces for participation and communication to promote active citizenship amongst young people. Being digital, um, being digital natives themselves, uh, the youth are now more exposed to more information online. And the current situation uh, where most young people are indoors can be utilized to engage young people online to be more aware of what's happening in their communities and build act um, groups for action. And uh, we, I hope uh, that uh, the youth, there would be a youth group um, in, in the different activities of Sameo, particularly in the high level talks, so that, um, so that the voice of the youth can be um, reflected as well. At the same time, uh, since I'm based in the Republic of Korea, I would like uh, to share uh, some examples uh, in the Republic of Korea. For example, the Ministry of Education has opened a platform for dialogue for educational paradigm shift in the post-corona era, where not only teachers and, uh, and students can take part, but, uh, but all different stakeholders who are um, interested in the field of education can share their suggestions on how to improve education in the future. At the same time, the Seoul Metropolitan Office of Education um, has opened a platform for online learning, not only limited uh, to, uh, to uh, regular classes in formal education, but at the same time, uh, technical and vocational education as well. So um, that I would just like I mentioned that uh, to highlight that it's important to go beyond uh, to um, form solidarity inside Southeast Asia between different member states, but at the same time, uh, to talk with our different partners um, uh, near and far as well who are already working in this, uh, in this, um, in uh, moving towards the post-COVID era. So um, that is uh, it, um, uh, my few points that I would like to share uh, with you this morning, and I hope uh, that we can continue the dialogue, and I hope that um, the uh, other um, youth in Southeast Asia would be encouraged uh, to take the lead towards uh, pushing our region towards the post-COVID era. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Roberto, for reminding us of the importance of our responsibilities as global citizens and of working together toward strengthening international cooperation, especially in times of crisis when solidarity is at its most needed. Um, and also, thank you for sharing your suggestions on focusing on skills development and on developing spaces for youth participation in policy formulation. Uh, now, before I invite our next uh, and final speaker, David, to present, I would like to take this opportunity to remind our viewers that the Q&A session will be held uh, after the conclusion of his presentation in approximately 10 minutes. Uh, therefore, now would be a good time to ask your questions in the comments section if you haven't done so already. So thank you for your attention. And David, please feel free to go ahead for the webinar's final presentation. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, Lynn, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, David Young. I'm working as a uh, consultant with uh, UNESCO Bangkok with the um, social and human sciences sector and also the communication information sector. And uh, I'll share my presentation now. So at UNESCO, my work primarily involves um, skills building trainings and initiatives for youth in Southeast Asia, um, usually involving qualitative research, policy development, and media advocacy and literacy. Um, when talking about media literacy, mostly my work is focusing on um, training about fake news and disinformation, how to combat it. Um, some of my work relates to awareness raising of vulnerable youth subpopulations, um, specifically indigenous youth and LGBTQI. I'm also working to increase opportunities for networking among youth organizations and networks in the region and developing resources for enhancing opportunities for youth participation. Um, again, I'm working with the social and human sciences sector and the communication and information sector. Um, so my work isn't really primarily focused on education, but of course, um, working with youth, education is a big part of it. 
Um, and as you can see, I have a couple of photos on the side here um, with QR codes if you're interested. Uh, top photo is uh, a hackathon that we did in Singapore with um, young indigenous people, um, where we worked with them to come up with um, prototypes for mobile applications for language learning. Um, the bottom left is uh, youth policy development in Laos. And then the bottom right is um, some of the work that we're trying to do with uh, COVID-19 and indigenous persons, which I will talk about in a brief second. So just a brief overview of UNESCO's work on youth. Our work is very much guided by um, the operational strategy on youth 2014-2021, which emphasizes um, building the capacity of young people to be involved in program design, program development, uh, research, media advocacy, awareness raising, et cetera. Um, so in UNESCO, for example, if we have a program that is targeted at young people, we want young people to be involved in that program as much as possible. Um, but often the case with policy and program development, young people maybe don't have the skills or understanding of how to do that. So we try to do capacity development as one of the first um, axes in the operational strategy on youth. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that work, you can also uh, hit this QR code here. So regarding uh, COVID-19 and our work with youth, um, education sector is doing quite a bit, but in terms of what social and human sciences sector is doing, um, we have two projects that are specifically focused on young people in COVID-19. Sorry, three projects. Um, one is the uh, Youth as Researchers COVID-19 Response, which is a global project that aims to train young people to conduct research on the impacts of COVID-19 on young people. Um, we're working with uh, two UNESCO chairs, one in Penn State University and the other in um, National University of Ireland in Galway to do that program. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. Another program is the Asia Indigenous Youth Platform COVID-19 Small Grants Initiative. Uh, which is aiming to support indigenous youth in South and Southeast Asia in responding to the pandemic, um, as well as raise awareness of impacts of COVID-19 on indigenous youth through research and advocacy. And then the final one is uh, UNESCO's office in Yangon, Myanmar, um, recently conducted a survey on youth and COVID-19 in that country. Um, so while the Myanmar survey is more extensive, the um, the other programs, um, the surveys were conducted to determine the priorities of them. So I wanna talk really quickly about the um, Asia Indigenous Youth Platform COVID-19 small grants. Um, so to do this program, we did an initial survey to kind of inform the priorities of what the program um, will cover. Uh, not a very extensive research, I think, um, only, we uh, covered only about 13 countries in South and Southeast Asia. Um, and, but based on the survey, we, we gained a few really interesting insights um, regarding the impacts and the response of indigenous youth so far in, um, to the pandemic. Uh, one is definitely on education. So the shift to online learning in most countries has disproportionately benefited those with strong internet access. Um, many indigenous communities are living in uh, rural and remote communities with um, either no Wi-Fi or very weak Wi-Fi. Um, impacts on employment. So migrant workers and those employed in the informal job sector, many of whom are indigenous youth, are now without work. Um, and in some cases, they're stranded and can't go home. Uh, and many social entrepreneurs, a lot of indigenous social entrepreneurs have been negatively affected by the pandemic as well. Another impact is on health. Um, some of the lockdown measures and communication barriers have resulted in an inaccessibility to health supplies and workers for those living in um, remote areas. Uh, there was one story in uh, Bangladesh how a young mother, um, due to the road lockdown conditions, couldn't make it to a health clinic in time and she died in childbirth. Um, 
Yeah, simply because of the road conditions uh, where she was living and the fact that she couldn't reach a hospital. Um, and then, of course, another impact is on safety. Um, a lot of Indigenous youth are stranded and can't go home. Uh, that was one, I think, issue that was mentioned by some of the other speakers here regarding um, non-Indigenous youth. And also in some countries, discrimination and violent conflicts are posing uh, major problems. Um, I won't name which countries in particular, but um, some uh, violent conflicts and human rights violations have really increased the vulnerability of these indigenous groups during the um, uh, the lockdown conditions. And this is just a brief graph of what I did. I mean, as you can see, like really the, the majority of answers were relating to employment and income. Um, a pretty big chunk relating to education, um, the concern about not being able to access education, inaccessibility of online learning, um, another big one about safety. When referring to safety, I'm not only referring to conflicts, um, but also um, many people who are stranded in the, in the cities and not having much security. Uh, knowledge of, um, and then knowledge of COVID was another uh, really big one. Um, having information that is accessible and in a language that they understand. In terms of response, many indigenous youth have been responding. One has been in production and distribution of food and medical aid, uh, including masks, hand, titers, hand sanitizer, organic foods and crops. Uh, they've been doing awareness raising of COVID-19, translating information from the government to make it more accessible to indigenous communities. And another is um, supporting uh, the quarantine centers and also supporting uh, returning migrants who are currently vulnerable. And I see I have about two minutes left, so I'll try to get through this. Um, UNESCO has also um, did an initial survey for um, the Youth as Researchers program to also determine the priorities of that program. Um, so over 700 young people from all over the world, 83 of whom were from Southeast Asia, answered an initial survey about the impacts of COVID-19. And some of the questions asked on the initial survey related to well-being, technology, and education. And these are just some quick insights from Southeast Asia. One of the questions was, in your opinion, are, what are the most important changes affecting education and learning resulting from the pandemic? Um, you can see some of the highest answers related to uh, teachers have less opportunity to pay attention to individuals. Uh, students need to know how to be self-made mo um, motivated to continue learning. Um, access to internet is unequal and impacts some learners. Um, Uncertainty about graduation qualifications is creating anxiety. Again, I want to stress these are just some initial results um, that are helping to prioritize a bigger research project that we will do over the next four months globally. Also, talking about well being, um, um, how has COVID 19 affected the well being of young people? Um, you can see mental well-being, coping well with worries and anxieties, physical well-being, having good health and energy, uh, and how can you occupy your time during the uh, COVID lockdown conditions. And then uh, talking about uh, technology. So um, how, how are people using technology with civic engagement during COVID-19? Um, Taking advantage of online courses is obviously one of the biggest ones. Social media campaigns. Um, so we do hope to have really more insights from Southeast Asia once, um, once the official research that we're gonna do is uh, launched. But these are just some very interesting um, results that we have so far. And then uh, lastly, I just wanna talk about the survey that was conducted in Myanmar which measured the perceptions and knowledge of youth in that country. Um, and 401 uh, young people ages 15 to 35 were um, interviewed um, with 23 questions um, over a period of about five days in April. And some quick findings that I'll just go over really quickly were, um, there are some myths and misunderstandings of COVID-19 identified within youth. Um, awareness of stigma and discrimination needs to be raised. 
Uh, media and information literacy. Uh, my colleague or um, the other speaker, Mr. Pachara, talked about digital literacy. Um, and I believe um, the other presenter from Upstate U talked about the importance of um, uh, media literacy and being able to discern false information. Um, that's one of the things that was found here. Uh, concerns on public awareness and also concerns on the outbreak situation and social economic impacts. And just very quickly before I finish, um, general knowledge, how can COVID-19 be spread? Um, sharing bathroom with others, someone mentioned, a lot of people mentioned that in Myanmar, sharing a living, living room with others, face-to-face uh, -face talking, uh, sharing water cups with other people. Mosquito bites, most people said no on that, fortunately. Um, which of the following precautionary measures are useful? Most people said exercise. Also, um, eating fish paste and chili and garlic, which is an interesting insight from Myanmar. And how are people verifying information relating to COVID-19? Um, a lot of people, yeah, looking at multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization, um, government sources. Uh, as you can see, not a significant amount from online and social media um, is used for sharing information. And then the last one I want to look at is um, what would be the implications of calling people who are infected a spreader of the virus? And most people said, yeah, they would um, feel stigmatized and discriminated against um, and they would be unwilling to be tested. Maybe they wouldn't want to go in for fear of um, being stigmatized by other people. People would know that they have COVID and they, they would worry about that. Um, I know I went through that really quickly. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, this is my email, da.young at uh, unesco.org. And um, yes, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to present and I look forward to uh, answering some of your questions. Uh, thank you, David, for outlining the various impacts and responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and initiatives from UNESCO on how to better address these, especially among uh, Indigenous youths who represent a vulnerable segment of society and are thus probably highly affected, and also for sharing the experience of Myanmar youths. Um, so, First, if I could thank all of our speakers and our audience for, uh, for, for listening, for, for sharing your knowledge and experience, and also to our viewers for listening. Um, so I guess we will begin uh, the Q&A session and address some of the questions uh, that we have received through the comments section. So, shall I start? So our first question comes from Pepe Bautista, uh, which is for Mr. Pachara, Mr. Dandy, and Ms. Marianne, asking what are the other strategies that you can suggest in order for the young learners to be globally competitive since they are at the center of learning? Uh, maybe I could ask Mr. Uh, Pachara for his thoughts. Right. Um, I think this is a very good question as we starting to hear more about the deglobalization from the COVID-19. I think the deglobalization may happen, but what teachers have to keep in mind that the internationalization has to keep going. So I, I suggest that's one um, theory about being internationalized at home um, by educating your students through the tools of, you know, knowledge space for knowledge uh, for for language, I think um, social media has played a big, big role uh, for me in particular. I improved a lot from Netflix. I have to admit on that after, you know, binge watching nonstop Netflix, you tell me anything on Netflix, I would understand. I almost finished Netflix actually. And YouTube as well, it's, it's very, very useful. Once you, you know, um, followed any YouTuber, you, you learn culture and language as well, and that's, um, but also internationalized is not only language, it's also about, you know, mindset and skills. So I'd suggest um, 
taking a look at programs that um, collaborate um, students from many parts of the world together. I think in ASEAN itself, the ASEAN Foundation has done a very good job in, in integrating the ASEAN youth together. Um, there's one program called, you know, Data Explorer, where it part partner with um, SAP in um, launching a competition on data analytical um, program for ASEAN youth as well. And there's one more program from my university. Um, they called it Globecom, when, um, you know, professor from, from 20 university across the world, what they te they're teaching one subject in common. So they, they pull a network together, they call, I think, PR professionals, and they launch a competition. Um, so they have students from each country um, meet virtually and discuss and work prior to the project. And then they have a meeting, like a, phys a physical meeting in one country for those like different teams to present. So, and so I think that social media and, you know, technological development has played a very big role in, in you know, empowering the students to be globally competitive uh, without, you know, have to, without having to uh, mobilize. So I think that would be an interesting point to explore for, for you know, teachers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pachara, for your insightful suggestions. I'm sure, I hope everybody's taking notes. Uh, maybe if I could uh, direct um, uh, the, the same question towards Ms. Uh, Mary Ann for, for her thoughts as the, as the ASEAN representative here. Uh, Ms. Mary Ann, what, what would be your suggestions? Thank you, Lynn, and uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to answer this question. Um, rather than uh, suggesting uh, additional strategies, perhaps what I'd like to do is to emphasize or uh, to underline what um, I had already mentioned in my presentation earlier, uh, which is uh, that one of the key emerging priorities of um, the ASEAN youth sector is uh, promoting 21st century skills to enable um, young people not just to face um, uh, the challenges of the new normal, but um, the for, a fourth industrial uh, revolution as well. Um, so definitely skills development is very important in, in this regard. And when we talk about skills development, of course, this does not just refer to um, the acquisition of um, academic and technical skills, um, but uh, 21st century skills. Uh, digital skills and entrepreneurship as well. Um, as you know, teamwork, collaboration, communication skills, problem solving skills, among uh, a host of other skills are uh, very critical to um, uh, the workplace. Um, and in addition to advancing um, uh, the development of um, uh, 21st century skills among uh, ASEAN youth, um, we are also reorienting ASEAN youth center, youth sector priorities um, towards uh, encouraging or increasing youth engagement in um, uh, regional policy dialogue. And this is very important because uh, young people have to be uh, able to take part in policy conversations that impact um, their future. And finally, um, I just wish to reiterate that um, promoting youth volunteerism, as I mentioned in, in presentation, um, as well as uh, promoting youth leadership, will still figure prominently in ASEAN's post-2020 uh, youth sector priority. Um, thank you, Ms. Marianne. Uh, indeed, skills development and youth participation, social volunteerism, activism seems to be uh, an overarching theme in this, um, in this webinar. Uh, maybe if I could uh, turn to Mr. Dandy for his thoughts as well, if you have anything to add, Mr. Dandy. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think I have to also reiterate my comment on the adaptability um, because we, we never know that how many new normals actually in the future uh, um, uh, we're, 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 we're facing on. So we have to be agile in a very specific condition. We have to be um, adaptive to new technology, new environment, um, adaptive to the skill that needed in the future. Uh, for example, if we don't really, uh, understand the school's materials, we have so many platforms, for example, YouTube and also e-learning platforms. 
and also one particular example the probably you have you you have now a, a bunch of webinars um across the internet that you can actually access uh, uh freely and then also some of the journals and academic papers are actually uh, uh uh free right now in the in the in, in a very specific time so i think you sh uh you young generation should uh uh should uh uh, should take advantage on, on that particular issues. And then lastly, uh, I think it's also important for you to have sort of like a support group. Uh, what I mean by support group is not really have to be your family, but it can be your a bunch of uh, group of friends or teachers or mentors that actually you can really talk to and then uh, share your anxiety and share your uh, experience during uh, ed your education or learning. So. Uh, that 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 can be proved that you're not alone in this uh, pandemic. So I think it's 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 quite important. And I I think the the last part is to take part in uh, activism and volunteerism uh, to engage with a uh, for example the youth forum that already mentioned uh, the issues that you're interested in ho new hobbies. Uh, I think that will be uh, that will give you advantage if if for example uh, a recruiter uh, in in um, in 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 the future we'll ask what 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 did you did uh what, what did you do uh when 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 the pandemic do you do a, a new uh learning a new skills or learning a new hobbies that that's probably uh a, a positive if you can do that uh, you probably have the positive side of uh, uh the, uh, the, the in the recruiter mindset that's all thank you uh, thank you very much mr dandy for um suggesting forming a circle of sharing as well as for drawing our attention to the wealth of digital information out there that people can turn to. Uh, so maybe I will move on to our second question, which comes from Diane Shane Alegre. Uh, this question is for Dr. Jerome, Mr. Ricoberto, and Mr. David. How could we teach the youth the leadership skills in this time of distance learning, we are, which we are adopting right now? Since if this is, if this will be our normal scenario, leadership skills uh, have been taken in group activities. Uh, maybe I could turn to uh, Dr. Jerome first for his thoughts. Okay, thank you, Diane. Thank you, Dean, for that question. Um, I want, I just want to share that teaching youth on leadership is not only learned by groups, but most especially, it should be learned individually first. In leadership, it is very important to have agency. And agency is what a person can do. So as a youth, you can do something. Let's put that into education context. When you practice your agency, it is very important that learners are involved in the process of learning. One controversial thing about distance learning, the online learning and remote thing now is about assessment. Many are questioning the authenticity of, it, of assessment. But despite of this issue, I think it is more important to embed to the values sets of, this, uh, of the youth that they should be involved. They should know how to do things on their own. No? And it is very important that when we empower them, let's say for us in terms of assessment, like we don't really prescribe what are the outputs, but instead they, we want them to produce an output out of their identities. And that is agency. And when we do that, we are actually teaching them to have integrity. We are teaching them to have self-regulation. And that is empowering for them, for them that leads them to learning leadership skills. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jerome, especially for the part on encouraging students to have their own power of agency. Uh, maybe if I could turn to Mr. Rigoberto, if he has anything to add on this. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, this uh, COVID-19 um, situation um, allows uh, everyone in the education sector to really rethink about education itself. Uh, that um, we um, that that it's not uh, purely about um, about reading and writing, uh, but really about uh, about learning how to live together. Uh, you know the values that uh, the the previous uh, speaker has mentioned a while ago, and um, that and this should be I think some uh, there should be a reflection in in education system 
uh, regarding this the, regarding this matter. And it starts with the teachers. So um, I think it's important that the, the the content of education at the same time, the attitudes of the teachers should really enable the the students to rethink about uh, the the importance of education, not just about rote learning, but really trying to um, to internalize the values of of of, of uh, understanding others, learning to live together, uh, and a global citizenship. So. Yeah, um, particularly that uh, that the issues that the the, the crisis itself um, is not only uh, it's not it affects everyone, and it's not only um, uh, it it may you know start from from one place, but for sure it has exacerbated um, you know other existing issues in our societies. So um, yes, so that's what I wanted to to say uh, that uh, the the content and uh, the content of education at the same time teacher development um, um, uh, uh, content should be uh, uh, calibrated towards uh, global citizenship, and uh, that that in the process um, uh, if if we um, refocus, we shift our focus from from just road learning towards global citizenship. I think there's a chance. Uh, for for the students to naturally develop this uh, leadership uh, that uh, was mentioned by the by the person who provided this question. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Nigoberto. Indeed, um, uh, global solidarity has never been more important. Uh, maybe if I could ask um, ask Mr. Duquet if he has anything to add. Yes, Lynn, can you hear me? I'm clear, David. Yeah, um, so, I mean, right now we're living in a time where young people want to do something, right? I mean, they don't want to be sitting around. They don't want to be aimless. And a lot of the mental health issues right now are from the fact that young people feel unmotivated. And there are so many opportunities for volunteerism out there. Um, we were just, a lot of the other presenters were talking about it, prioritizing volunteerism. There's so many opportunities, but unfortunately, what I find in my work is a lot of young people don't actually know about them. And really, these opportunities are perfect. These volunteer um, engagements are perfect opportunities to enhance your leadership skills. You know, you learn by doing, you learn by um, volunteering, you learn by taking action. In many ways, I think that's how you learn leadership skills. Rather than it being taught, it's kind of learned by doing. But I think the role that, um, educators have, the role that schools have is by possibly not only providing more um, immersive learning opportunities for students, but I, by also um, providing them with opportunities to um, engage in volunteerism. And as we can see, I mean, with um, the online research work that we're doing, some of the other work that we're doing, um, there are a lot of young people that will go out there and do this kind of work because they care about what's happening. They want to make an impact. They want to respond in any way that they can. And what we find is it's actually really not um, too difficult for them to do these kind of leadership activities online. Um, requires a bit of motivation, requires a bit of you know focus, but I think if they knew about these opportunities, then um, they're perfect opportunities to develop their research skills. So uh, to recap, I think um, education uh, teachers have a, um, a role in um, working with their students to provide these opportunities, giving them the chance to go out and do that, whether it be through, I don't know, class projects or real volunteer opportunities that are outside of the school. I think that would be one of the um, better ways to enhance the leadership skills um, through online and uh, distant learning. Uh, thank you so much, David, for um, what you've added to the discussion. Um, the key message here being uh, learning by doing uh, through volunteerism, through projects to help develop leadership skills. Um, so, um, as, you, uh, as you have seen from our presenters' presentations, if you have any questions to direct towards them, you could always email them directly if their email has been provided. So, now I will call the Q&A to a close. And I would now like to invite Simeo Secretariat's Deputy Director for Administration and Communication, uh, Dr. Krisa Shai Somsaman, to deliver the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thanks for your great work in moderating this session. It, uh, it's very smooth, enjoyable, and effective webinar today. 
Uh, for our 3,000 live viewer today, uh, Lynn is from Simeo Spafa it, on, on the archaeology and fine art. For some of you who are uh, familiar with Simeo on the educational aspect, uh, Simeo also focused on science and also on the um, culture. With Simeo Spafa is one of our centers that's focusing on the uh, culture part. Okay, uh, let me. Since Lynn has already did a very great work on the summarizing, I'll, I'll go really quick on each of the our presentation today. I uh, would like to thank Melly and Teresa Muson from ASEAN Secretariat uh, from giving us the, the idea of the youth index, youth development index, which uh, ASEAN Secretariat using for guiding the policy. And they are glad to know that the, also the second phase of the YDI, which includes ASEAN value, awareness, and identity. And then the, we have also the post 2020 ASEAN education priority on the future of the education skill development, inclusive education, capacity building for educational personnel. And also, I'd like, like to thank our youth representative, Mr. Fachara. A good friend of mine, actually. Well, uh, thanks for sharing us with the, your, your idea of the struggle of the rock out generation. You, your struggle as well, right? Um, and your 3 3D strategy of uh, the opportunity, where the opportunity is now, what's in your toolbox, and how to stay relevant. These are the very key thing to look at as the as the youth. And also, thanks for sharing us your learning using uh, YouTube and uh, Netflix also. I would like to thank uh, Danny from CSIS Indonesia on your uh, analysis of the short-term and long-term effect on the youth. Uh, also, you mentioned about the high job insecurity, wage and unemployment, and the need, the need more engage in social activism and volunteerism, which would be uh, increase the empathy and creativity in use as well. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Jerome, uh, Dr. Jerome for the eight key strategy, which uh, based on the three principles of inclusion, compassion, and innovation. And you also add more on the role of the family and the involve of youth in uh, decision-making. Also, thank you, uh, Ricoberta from UNESCO FCU. Uh, on your the important lesson and uh, implication on on the youth, uh, the the, uh, the implication on the ensure continuity of education to all means to develop skill to what new normal, and also uh, the important thing is to develop space for participation and communication to promote active citizenship. Uh, David Jiang from UNESCO Bangkok, thank you so much from giving us very uh, insight from your survey and your work on the indigenous youth. Uh, you talk about the myth and misunderstanding on COVID-19, the awareness of stigma, and also media information literacy skill. Well, all, all of our information that we discussed today, would like to put, uh, add some more synthesis. Well, what we have learned today and now what would we need to be keep on going is to ensure the continuity of education via flexible learning, which we have discussed flexible learning earlier in our previous webinar. If anyone wants to understand more about flexible learning, you can keep watching our previous webinar on YouTube. We have it uh, available or easily accessible. Also, the empower of family for home-based learning. The, in, in lo the lockdown, it's very important for families to involve in the learning of all the other that kids, other students. And also everyone has addressed that the media in information literacy skills very necessarily. Education needs to be adapted to, to be future ready and also inclusive. And we also need to seek the opportunity and equip yourself with all the different toolbox. Also important is to promote active citizenship via participation and collaboration also. Uh, we, 
TPO also have another webinar series which is very interesting and would like to invite you all to join our next webinar on Tuesday, 30th of June. This is a very special e-forum on reaching the unreached and teach calls to action during COVID-19 pandemic. We have a registration link so you can register to be able to access this uh, special e-forum and we also uh, broadcast it live on YouTube. Uh, let me mention that for, for this special e-forum, we won't have the e-certificate for, for this special e-forum. But for today's webinar, I would like to announce that we have the e-certificate for anyone who would like to have the e-certificate. Uh, but we need a lot more work for you to do. Uh, you need to fill up the certificate validation and assessment form after watching this webinar. Uh, the, the work that you need to do is to provide reflection on how would you like to apply the knowledge from this webinar. It's not need to be very much, about 50 to 150 words. Um, we have the link provided in the uh, bottom right of the screen and also uh, you can scan using QR code. The deadline for submission of this reflection is 27 of June 2020. Bangkok time, let me emphasize that. And also, uh, please, this is very important, please ensure that your spelling of the name and email address is correct because the certificate will be automatically generated and sent to you by email. So uh, ensure that everything is correct. So we don't need to recorrect, uh, we don't need to fix any mistake that happened. And uh, the certificate, will be ready and will be sent to you by email on or before the 31st of August. For any more inquiry, you can send us an email at webinar at cmeo.org. So at the end of this webinar, we'd like to thank you everyone. Thank you all the speaker. Thank you all um, our audience, our CMO staff. I would like to wish you well and uh, be being healthy physically, economically, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. And see you again next time in our, our next webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.